I am, I am excited about this. This is our last Omni in our teaching series called This is God. Next week, we've got one more part, but next week is going to be a very unique piece of the puzzle. And so you just, you can't, you got to hang around for it. Uh, but this is our last Omni. We've, we've talked about a lot of other Omnis. Who is God? Let's reintroduce ourselves. Let him reintroduce himself, as it were, to us. I'm excited about this one. This, this has got me, this is a, there's a few things here I, I had not realized before. So Father, would you speak to our hearts? We're, we're a bunch of hard-headed, stubborn people. You know that. But you made us. So could it be you could speak through our our darkness, our discouragement, our discombobulation, our distraction, whatever it is. Speak, Lord. In the name of Jesus, amen. J.R. Ross recounts a story of William James. William James is a philosopher and a psychologist. We're talking way back. He was the first psychologist in the U.S. to offer courses in the, in the subject, in the discipline, psychology. So we're talking a little, a little bit back here, but uh, J.R. Ross recounts a story of Dr. James. He's given a lecture on cosmology. I don't know why I always want to say cosmetology. But cosmology, I don't know what his connection to cosmology were, and the, uh, but he, he studied, he knew the structure of the solar system, and so he's given this lecture, and he's accosted, and that's the word J.R. Ross uses. He's accosted at the end by a little old lady who takes her little finger and points it into Dr. James's face and says, Dr. James, your theory, your theory that the sun is the center of the universe and, and we're on a ball that goes around that center of the universe, it's, it rotates around, it's, it's, it's convincing. It's convincing, but it's wrong. I've got a better idea. Dr. James, gracious as he was, and what's that? Well, she says, we live on a crust of earth which is on the back of a giant turtle. Not wishing to demolish the little absurd theory that she was bringing, with his, he, could, he could amass this scientific evidence and just blow her out of the water. He contained himself, and he said, I'm going to just gently dissuade her from this, from this. So he says to her, ma'am, if your theory is correct, what does that giant turtle stand on? You know, the, the, the earth is on the back of the giant turtle. What is the giant turtle on? Oh, she says, uh, Smirk, you are a very clever man, Mr. James, and that's a good question but I have an answer to it, and it is this. What is it? That giant turtle stands on the back of another giant turtle, slightly larger. All right, Dr. James said, what does the second turtle stand on? To this, the little old lady smiled triumphantly. Oh, she said, sir, it's turtles all the way down. Turtles all the way down. And that's become a bit of an expression in the English language. Rocks all the way down, turtles all the way down. It's meant to mean, mean forever. As, as far as you're going to go, it's turtles all the way. Our theme text, we've read it every single week. Come on, we've got it memorized. John, put it on the screen for you, or at least the first five words. John chapter 17 and verse 3. Now this is eternal life. What's the rest of it? This is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God. This is the invitation of Jesus as he prays in John 17. This is eternal life. Eternal, an operative word, eternal, meaning forever. Well, what was before that? No, 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 no. You, you failed to grasp the significance of the word if you have to ask that. Forever has no beginning, and forever has no end. And so we put two words together. Of course, the Latin word omni, meaning all, or self-initiated, meaning God is omni-benevolent. He is love, not that he is all, just that he is all love, but that he is the source, the very origin of love. It's the Greek word omni. So we've, we've 
attach the, the English word existent, omni-existent, to express God's eternal nature. He never had a beginning and he'll never have an end. The Bible, and not only is he though all existing, but he's self-existing. In other words, he's the source of existence. Nothing exists outside of him imparting its existence. That Latin word omni, powerful when you attach it to a word. Now, grab your Bibles. We got a verse to look at here in Psalm 90. Now, Psalm, of course, is a, is a collection of Psalms, most of which are attributed to David. This is not. Psalm 90 is a Psalm Moses wrote, the great leader from Egypt to Canaan. Psalm 90. Of course, David must have sung this song. Of course, of course, he, he sung it, but he was, he was singing the words of Moses. Verse 1, Psalm 90 and verse 1, Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. As much as there are generations, you've been there. Now verse 2, before the mountains were born or you were brought forth, before the mountains were born or you brought forth the whole world from everlasting to everlasting. That's one direction and the other direction. You are God. Jumping ahead to verse 4, a thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by or like a watch in the night. Time. Eternity before you. Nothing. Now, Moses, in a little bit of poetic expression, then a couple of verses later, takes and contrasts eternity past and eternity future of who God is compared to who we are. In verse 10, he brings it up. Our days, our days, may come to 70 years or 80. If our strength endures, yet the best of them are but trouble and sorrow. Hang that on a hook in your mind. Ooh, there's something there. Our days, the best of them are but trouble and sorrow, for they quickly pass and we fly away. Did you catch that? A thousand years for God is just a, a, a drop in the bucket. What is our 80 years? Our 70, our 80. And if you're borrowing some, you get 90 or 100. But what are those compared to a thousand years that's just a, a drop for God? This thing of eternity, whew, it's a little hard to wrap our minds around. It stretches, it stretches our gray matter. I want to do, I want to, I want to do something. I never thought I would do this. Never. I'm going to use something that I, I very much don't believe to prove or to make my point. Okay? So just for the record, what comes next, I don't believe. But it's going to make the point. Comes the science. You scientific minds. We've got the two contrasting conclusions. Creation, a seven-day creation. God spoke and it was. Genesis 1. Contrasted with the other conclusion, evolution. But do you know that both embrace eternity past and eternity future? Both of them claim that there's eternity in both directions. No matter which conclusion you have come to or anyone has come to, they have had to they have had to come to the realization that there is an eternity past and an eternity future. Let's go there. Let's, let's use evolution, of which I do not believe, to make the point. What's evolution? All right. Rewind just a few years. Well, 650 million of them. You get to a warm spell that happened in between Earth's snow storms, giant snow periods that covered the, the globe, and in between two of those came this warm spell known as the Cryogenian period. This is, this is when it warmed up and, and those single cell life forms all of a sudden found an environment in which they began to evolve into more complex beings, life forms. All right, 650 million years ago, Mr. Darwin, what does that turtle stand on? Glad you asked. 
Glad, to, glad you asked because before that turtle, there was 3.8 billion years ago. Now we're talking 3 billion, 800 million years ago. Life had existed on this planet for, in, in single cell form, all right? So we're just talking about single cell, simple life. I mean, it reduced to its, to its most basic form and, and, and it exists for, for these billions of years. It wasn't until 650 million years ago that that life form became more complex. So we're going from 650 million years ago to now 3.8 billion years ago which is more than three billion years, these single cell life forms existed. 3.8 billion years ago is what they believe would be the world's oldest fossils, single celled bacteria, tiny little things. Okay, Mr. Darwin, what did that turtle of 3.8 billion years, single celled life, what did it stand on? Good, good question. 4.54 billion years ago, 4.54 billion years ago, so now it's a little more than a billion years before that, the planet that we know of as Earth came into existence. It was from some volcanic gassing, outgassing that formed this planet that the single cell life, a billion years later, the single cell life in between. That came in, and then later, three billion years later, in between two giant snowstorms, a warm spell made the, made the single-celled life grow, become more complex. Okay, so now we're 4.54 billion years ago, and the Earth, from some volcanic outgassing, has come to be, all right? What did that turtle stand on? Glad you asked. Because 13.7 billion years ago, which is nearly 10 billion years before the planet Earth was formed, 13.7 billion years ago is what we know of and we refer to as the Big Bang. 13.7 billion years ago, space, not matter within space, but space itself. That means if you and I had existed, we would have had to exist within this amount of space. Space was less than an inch big. Space, not matter, space was less than an inch big. And 13.7 billion years ago, that tiny hot space, it was, it was hot. I don't know what its temperature was, but it was hot. It big banged. And that big bang made the universe. 13.7 year, million year, billion years ago. Now, just to clarify, that Big Bang did not create matter. It was not matter that exploded. It was space itself that exploded. So space went from less than an inch to the size of a universe that has now begun and, and continued to expand. 13.7 billion years ago. That's just, just in case you like a number. That's 5 trillion, 500 million year, days ago. Five trillion, 500 million days ago. All right, Mr. Darwin, what did that turtle stand on? At which point he would lean back in his chair and say, that's an annoying question. Both both scenarios of what took place or what, what has taken place since the Big Bang and before the classic cycle uh, universe scenario, classic cycle universe scenario, or the, uh, what's the other one? It's the class, cosmic egg, the cosmic egg scenario. Both are scenarios of evolution, of what took place, how the Big Bang impacted. The classic cycle is that there have been repeated Big Bangs throughout the uh, eternity. So it's a classic cycle. Our recent Big Bang, our recent Big Bang of 13.7 billion years ago is just the most recent of all the Big Bangs. But there have been Big Bangs all the way go going back for, for eternity past. The, the egg, the cosmic egg scenario is just that, that it exploded uh, and that it is continuing to explode and get larger and larger as it goes. So you ask the question, well, what happened before 13.7 billion years ago? 
Both of the scenarios, both of the evolution scenarios admit that before the Big Bang, there was eternity past, but they don't know. Neither one of them denied that there was an eternity before the Big Bang. It's just that 13.7 billion years ago, we don't know. Then a voice speaks up, Alexander Vilikin. He's a Ukrainian, professor of evolutionary science, directs some cosmology institutes, very, very published, published man. He's, he's referenced in Discovery Magazine. Now, let me just share with you what Discovery Magazine is saying, and then I'm going to put it on the screen. It's not, it's not ready yet. But speaking of of Alexander Vilikin's work, he's saying, look, I have spent 35 years looking at this thing, studying this thing. We go back, now listen to this. This, this got on my, my nerve. We go back, he says, 14 billion years ago to the Big Bang. 14 billion years ago, excuse me, sir, I thought it was 13.7. That's a difference of 300 million years. You don't just make those kind of mistakes, sir. No, he says, we go back about 14 billion years. Which is it, 14 billion or 13.7? It bothered me. But Villikin says, look, you go back 14 billion years ago, and he says, because, because I've studied it for 35 years, I'm going to say that nothing existed before then. Nothing existed before 14 billion years ago. There wasn't anything. There is no eternity past. He, den he, he, he is denying the, the classical, uh, the two other scenarios of evolution. He denies it, says, no, everything began, except for the laws of physics, everything began 14 billion years ago. And then you ask him, well... So what did the laws of physics do before 14 billion years ago? And he says, I don't know. I don't know what they did. Maybe they just sat there and waited until the Big Bang. I don't know. Discovery Magazine, in referencing him, listen to them. I'm just going to read them. Asking the question about what came before the Big Bang can never truly be answered. What happened before that? It's an annoying question. Quoting Discovery Magazine. Villikin, and then Discovery Magazine references Villikin's work. And I wanna, I wanna reference this. While he, he has a hard time seeing anything before 14 billion years ago, although the, uh, generally all evolutionists believe that there's an eternity past, even before the Big Bang. There had to be, it was just a constant red, hot, little half inch, space that just existed forever. Oh, I just want to, I just want, you're so close. Really? You're going to believe that a half inch hot piece of space existed forever? Would, would it be that big of a step to just say, there must be a God that existed forever? But Villikin says, listen, I have studied this for 35 years. At, before the Big Bang, I, I, I can't figure it out. So I'm just going to call it quits at the Big Bang. He says, but, but based on inflation, that, that is the expanding universe, based on inflation, this is what he's, he's, he's uh, summarized as in Discovery, Discover Magazine. Villikin's bubbling universe, I'll put it on the screen. Inflation was, by definition, eternal into the future. Once initiated, it would not stop. In other words, his understanding of the Big Bang, this universe that's expanding, because of that inflation, it cannot ever stop. So while Villikin denies that there's an eternity past, he says there is absolutely an eternity future. Oh, they're so close. All of these bright minds, and they come up just short. They're arguing for an eternity past, an eternity future. <sighs> They prove the point. They prove the point. There is omni-existence. There is. <laughs> There's not a creationist or an evolutionist that can deny it. All right, enough of science. What about philosophy? Good old Aristotle, right? Father philosophy. He argued very clearly. He said, you cannot deny it. You cannot deny it. There is a world that must exist through, from and through eternity. 
And every philosopher worth their salt after Aristotle has agreed with that. There is eternity. There's eternity. It's not argued. The only thing that's argued in philosophy is generally this. Uh, is there a God or isn't there a God in this eternity? And then if you do agree that there's a God, the question becomes, is this God timeless? Meaning, is he outside of time? Does he not experience our, our time? Or is he within time? Does he exist within time even though he exists for eternal time? Well, let me make an argument for the latter. Is God timeless? Meaning, is he a distant, eternal God that has no idea what we do in our bubble of time? William Lane Craig, he's an analytic philosopher, uh, an apologist, theologian. He says, listen, God has to, based on, based on all of the factors here, God has to be able to relate to our time. He's not a timeless God. In other words, when we're saying, God, we're passing through time in a linear way, you have no idea what we're going through. He, he, we were made in his image, Lane argues, and so we, we, have to, we have to understand, we have to, we have to, he has to know what time is. And so he argues for the understanding that there was no time before creation and then at Genesis 1-1, time began and God inserted himself into time and will forever be in time. Fine, fair enough. John Finberg, in his book, No One Like Him, No One Like Him, he argues that this is absolutely the case. If God were timeless, meaning he had no, no reference to time in his being, that he would be remote and distant, and this would be the kind of the Greek classical gods that are there, but they don't understand human life. But that's not the Christian God. And that's what the New Testament bears out in this idea of God who experiences time. I'll take you to one more theologian, one more philosopher. His name is Fernando Canale. I know him, he taught me in my graduate studies. He's a, an incredible mind, so incredible that you know, things were permanently fried in my brain trying to take notes in his class. But he takes Exodus chapter three and he says this is a key text. Now Exodus chapter three is God speaking to Moses. He's sending Moses to go lead Israel back from Egypt to Canaan. God is speaking to Moses, all right? The same Moses who wrote Psalm 90, who wrote that poetic expression of God from generation to generation. It's that Moses. God is speaking to that Moses. Exodus chapter 3 and verse 14. God said to Moses, I am who I am. And then in verse 15, he says, this is my name forever. The name you shall call me from generation to generation. This is my name forever. I am who I am. Translated, that expression, I am who I am, can be translated correctly. I am who I am in the present, or I will be what I will be in the future. It is forever a present and a future term, and it's masterfully done. Only God can come up with something that is accurately translated. Present and future at the very same time. I am who I am, or I will be who I will be. It's the same, it's both. Put Fernando Canale's words on the screen. I want you to catch these because this, whoo, this is good. God reveals his being as his presence. Don't go too fast over that part. God reveals his being as his presence. God's reality, then, is temporal, not in the sense of being constricted to the limits of created time, but in the sense of being directly compatible with it. In other words, when God put us in his world, he put us in the world of time that he experiences. While he's eternal past and eternal future, he is in time. But that first line, that first line, God reveals his being as his presence. Okay, I'm gonna do my best to, to, to explain this. 
uh, because it, it's, it's so powerful. Let me put a couple more lines on the screen and then we'll, we'll, we'll explain it out. We'll flush it all out. Andrew's Bible commentary, uh, Bible commentary I just, I've just started reading. I uh, just got my hands on it. It's a new publication. Uh, in reference to this verse, looking at this verse says, look, it is clear. This is what God is expressing. God has been with us in the past, is in the present, and will be in the future. It's consistent. He's through all time. Let me put a summary statement on here, though. This is what Fernando Canale was trying to communicate. He, that is God, does not have a being apart from being present. Okay, that's what Fernando Canale was trying to express. God expresses his being in his presence. For example, I can say to my family, my wife called me up, hi, sweetie, how are you doing? Where are you at? If I'm at home and I ask her where, I don't really have to know. She's at one of two places, at the store or at work, right? There's just, that's her world, mostly the store. Just kidding. Uh, why do I not read my notes? What Fernando Canale is saying is that there is, God says, when, when God says, I, I am who I am, it is his presence. He does not have a being. He cannot say to us, I'm over here. He would cease to exist if he was not present with us. Wait a minute. In other words, God cannot be removed. He is present, that's his being. If he was ever not present, he would cease to exist. His existence is his presence. His presence is his being. Amen. Psalm, Psalm 90, verse one. This is Moses now reflecting on that word from God in the desert when God said, I am who I am. I will be who I will be. I am with you from generation to generation. Moses, I believe those words inspired Moses to write Psalm 90. And he writes, Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations before, he says before in verse two, the mountains were born or you brought forth the whole world from everlasting to everlasting. You are God. God cannot cease to be present or he ceases to exist. And then those words from Moses in his poetic expression in verse 10, our days may come to 70 years or 80 if our strength endures, yet the best of them are but trouble and sorrow for they quickly pass and we fly away. We, our lives are filled with sorrow and trouble that nobody can deny. You want to get a good... You want to get a good conversation going that will last a while? Just ask somebody, what's wrong with life? I just read an inter a study this week, an interview of 65 and older. You, you 65 years and older folks. The, the, the question was, what are your greatest regrets? Number one greatest regret, those 65 and older, they were not careful enough when choosing a life partner. Number two, they were not diligent to resolve family estrangement. Number three, they put off saying how they felt. Number four, they didn't travel enough. Number five, they spent too much time worrying. That's our life. We're not careful enough. We don't do enough. We, we don't step out enough. We spend too much time worrying. We... That's our life. That's what our life is filled with. Those 70 or 80 years are overwhelmed with discombobulation, discouragement, distractions, darkness. And so let me read you now a mosaic of verses. This comes from the book of Psalms and the gospel of John. I'm going to read them as if they're one, just a run on of verses. Let your heart live forever. The Lord knows the days of the blameless and their inheritance will be forever. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life. That's Psalm 23, right? And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. But God will redeem my soul from the power of death. He will receive me. I give eternal life to them, says Jesus, and they will never perish. Whoever believes in him shall not perish, John 3, 16, but have eternal life. This is the, this is the proclamation of scripture. Not only is there an omni-existent God, but that omni-existent God gives his, his eternity to us. 
Well, that's good news, except if your 70 or 80 years have been dark and discouraging. You don't want an eternity of that. When God says, I'll take your 70 or 80 years and give you eternity, we're saying, no thanks. I don't want more of that. And it takes me back to a story of a Gita. A pastor friend of mine relates this story. A Gita lived in Latvia, and he was there in Latvia, just sharing some, some hope. Latvia, as you know, it's a beautiful culture. Peace-loving, lively people. But that's not how their story has always been. So they've suffered at the hands of the Soviet military. One night, his pastor friend sharing the story of God giving us eternal life. He'll give it to us. It's a gift. The John 3, 16, right? Nagita comes up to him at the end. Says, that's, listen, I don't know if there's a God, but if there is, he can keep his eternal life. I don't want to live forever. What's your story, Agita? He says, listen, Soviet soldiers came into our home. They first shot my father in the head and then they abused me and my mother in front of my brothers and my fiance. After they abused us and they made them watch, they killed my brothers and my fiance. Then they made my mother and I go through our whole house and bring out anything of value, sentimental or legal value. We had to pile it in our front yard and watch pictures and marriage licenses burn. They took my mother away that afternoon and I have never seen her since. I don't want to live forever. It's been too long, just these few years already. What about your regrets? Maybe it's, maybe you hasn't, it's not the Soviet, it's not the military. It's not the, maybe you don't have a story like Agitha. It's just full of regrets. I don't want this kind of life for eternity. That would be punishing. I want to do with you in just, just, just these few moments what this pastor did with Egita. He asked her to close her eyes. You can close your eyes. You can keep them open. He asked her, he said, would you picture one of the happiest, fulfilling, most loved moments of your life? Maybe it's a Thanksgiving for us Americans, a Christmas time with your family, the moment you were proposed to. Oh, there's lots of moments. There's lots of moments you could go through. And I remember six years old, my dad coming home from work early, telling me and my best friend, we, we played wiffle ball in the backyard until it got dark on most summer nights. But this day, he told us to grab our gloves and load up. I'd never been to a sports game. I'd been to the church league softball game, but we didn't have to have tickets for that. But my dad loaded us up, and we went down to the stadium. We had to have a ticket. And we got in and watched baseball. I'm sitting next to my friend, my dad, wow, everything was right and beautiful in that moment. Everything was good. What if that's what God wants to give you for eternity? What if that's heaven's plan? God couldn't exist himself for eternity if he he had to live with the regrets and the discouragement, the abuse and the pain and the suffering. It was never meant to be for eternity. Eternity was meant to be, but not that. Which is why Jesus came and said, I'm gonna show you God. He lives in time. He lives forever, but he lives in the time that you live. Would you accept his offer to live forever? 
whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Agita, there in Latvia, tears rolling down her face. Okay, she says. Okay. That's what God wants to give? Okay, I'm willing to give it a shot. Our worship team is coming up. What if it's that most beautiful, not the abuse that you've suffered, not the pain of neglect, of hurt, not the physical suffering of whatever is ailing us, Not our minds going as our age increases. No, not the 70 or 80 years, which is why exactly Moses put that in there. He said, look, I'm gonna contrast it with you. Our 70 or 80 years are filled with pain and sorrow and trouble, but not eternity. He's contrasting the two. The 70 or 80 are not the picture of eternity, beloved. We are hurting, but that's not our future. Hallelujah. And the omni-existent God who has existed forever, nobody can deny it, not a philosopher, not an evolutionist, not a creationist. Nobody can deny it. there's an eternity past. And they all admit that there's an eternity future with a God who wants to give you not what you've experienced in your 70 or 80 years, but what he knows is possible outside of that. Let's send as we sing Psalm 34. I saw the Lord and he answered me Yeah.
bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace until again we meet in worship. Amen.